I mean, you don't need to go into details, but I'm just curious on that topic. Were you surprised by the breakup? Like when the band first broke up? Yeah. I mean, I was surprised that it got down to lawsuits and shit like that. Yeah. You don't want to end up in court. You just want to settle, get this thing done, make your peace and move on with your life. Mm. And it seemed to be able to drag on. And I wish, you know, it's none of my business anyway, but, but it was sad to see people that, that were once best friends and loved each other uh, no longer work together. Yeah. Because you like to think that great things last forever. And that's the era I come from. Mm. You know, I come from an era where bands stayed together and for the most part, nobody got replaced. And when they did, it would always be like this watered down version. Mm. You know, imagine Jimmy Page with Eric Clapton playing guitar or something. You know? mm. Or sorry, Led, Led Zeppelin with Eric Clapton playing guitar. You know, imagine Dave, you know, David Gilmore no longer in Pink Floyd, you know. So Dear Agony was the last Breaking Benjamin studio record you produced. What was the vibe like with the band during the making of that record? This record was at a time where Ben was, you know, going through health issues. Mm. And that's why there's a picture of his brain on the album jacket. Oh. Uh, is that actually that his is. brain? Yeah. Oh, wow. So at that time, there was a lot of question marks as to the future of the band. There was a lot of unrest with business. It was a tumultuous record mm. of Ben's health. But we got through it. I think that the tracks show the tumultuousness of the, of the personalities. Uh, at the beginning, we started very, very kind of like, let's go team, we're going to do this again. And then as, as it unraveled, it, it, it got very individual hmm. and less, I, I'm, I hear this a lot from other people, like, you know, that's when people start having their own tour buses. Hmm. It happens. It happens. Only to come full circle as we all have to go through those things in our lives to learn from, you know, success and, and the pressure of success uh, and the pressure of writing and the responsibilities that go with being in a band. And like I said, you know, we'd all, it would be great if everybody was in, you know, Rush and you 2 and the Foo Fighters for 30 years, 40 years. But the truth is that, 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 Sometimes that's just not possible. And I noticed that a lot of the bands I've worked in have lost a member or two, or sometimes all of them is in the case of Breaking Benjamin, yeah. which is sad for somebody like me because we created a sound together, you know, and some people like the new sound better. Sometimes people like the new songs better. Um, but for me, I'm, you know, I remember only fondly the, the time we made those records. And I don't listen to the new records because I kind of know what they sound like already because we created that sound, okay, you know, okay. together as a team. That's the sound of the band. So, I mean, when it comes to the Dear Agony record and the impending breakup of the band, it seems to me like the lyrics to Give Me a Sign reflected the mood of things. I love that song. And that song is definitely special on, on that record, Dear Agony. I think that was like a, a, a tumultuous time. Again, that song was very relevant to what was happening. I love that song. I love... When I mix that song, I think I was like crying a little bit just because it was so emotional. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure anybody else felt like I did, but I thought that song was incredibly powerful. Hmm. Um, I love the verses to the song. Everything about the song worked. The melody was great. And Ben did an incredible job on that song. He really did. It came together like all the other songs on that record. I mean, we had it down by then, except as I said, it wasn't everybody in the room. It was all done individually. But I felt like that song also coming in the door with I Will Not Bow was very special. When you guys were recording the song, was it, a, was it an emotional experience as well? Not at all. We did the drums hmm. and the bass separately, the guitars separately, the vocals separately. So at what point did it really hit you that it was emotional? Like, did you hear a demo of it before you started working on it, for instance? Absolutely. Yeah, every song. Hmm. Yeah. And so during the demo phase, did it already strike you as emotional? Yes, but not. It, the most emotional I was was when we were mi mixing it, when I was mixing it. And, you know, it's, mixing is really interesting because you're in this room by yourself, kind of for the most part, by yourself. And you got the tracks and the engineer set it up so it sounds amazing already. And, you know, but you're kind of choosing and picking what you want to make a little bit louder. You know, you're kind of fighting with it a little bit. And you're not really paying attention that much. Hmm. 
And then you leave the room and you, you know, go get a sandwich or walk outside and take a phone call. You come back in the room and it's done, you know, because you're listening to it with fresh ears and you go, wow. You know, as you're doing it, you don't recognize it. Hmm. But at the end of it, you're in shock. And it hits you up. You, you listen to it as a listener and not as somebody that's working on it. Hmm. That's really cool, man. So that, that moved me at that moment. That, that I remember. I mean, I remember liking it because I work in sections, you know, eight bars at a time. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, it's kind of like threading a suit together. You know, you're sewing sections together, yeah. especially when you're mixing. So at the end of the mix was when it hit me. Yeah. It was like, this is crazy. Do you like, know if the other guys amazing. felt that way too? At that time, there was nobody in the studio. Hmm. Hey, fair enough, man. Uh, so you don't get to see. You know, when everybody's there for the mix. Actually, I think Ben was there. Yeah. I mean, I don't think Ben, Ben would always look at everything technically, you know, and, and as if the things were the right level and the kick drum. He's very, very much in the drums. Hmm. Uh, um, I think Ben, you know, if anything was, was very sort of nonchalant about this, you know, he knew it was great already and we had a job to do and we did our job to, you know, that's how I saw it with him. It was not one of those things when the record went platinum that he called me and was, can you believe it? We were, it's like one of those, <laughs> you know, yeah, whatever. It's like, oh, well, another platinum record. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. just another platinum record. <laughs> well, at that time, we already had platinum records. That's so, so cool. we, you know, we, you know, I think that's the thing. I, to me, I'm different. Like to me, every time's an amazing time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, if, if somebody says your record went gold or your single went gold or whatever, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm happy for the band. Yeah, sick. Hopefully one day, you know, there could be like a reunion or something. I don't know if anyone could recreate something that happened 25 years ago. I know Rush are probably one of the only bands that were able to do that. Um, they never really changed. They, I mean, they changed each record, but yeah, I mean, people go to see them because that's why. Because they know exactly what, or Bruce Springsteen know what they're getting. They're getting a great shot, great lights, great sound, great yeah. music. Now, before I forget, you mentioned a little bit earlier that there was a Bruce Springsteen story with Breaking Benjamin. What exactly is that story? Uh, this was on the Dear Agony record. Okay. It's pretty cool. So I get this call in the afternoon. <laughs> Chad, you coming tonight? I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't wait. You know, it's going to be a great show, blah, blah, blah. New Jersey and, you know, at, at the uh, arena. Prudential Center. He says, you know, Bruce Springsteen's coming. I go, what are you talking about? Bruce Springsteen's coming. I go, get out of here. He's not coming. He's full of it. Oh, no, he's coming to the. I go, you know, you wish Bruce Springsteen was coming. <laughs> I'm driving to the show. Get a call. You know, Bruce Springsteen's here. I'm like, I'm like okay. Anyway, the band <laughs> does their show. Yeah. And they are fantastic anyway bruce springsteen so i'm going backstage and there's bruce springsteen going backstage he's got his laminated pass and he's with this kid anyway so i get backstage and there's bruce and his kid and uh i had met bruce springsteen once before on a phone call a few with bruce hornsby i was producing bruce hornsby who would stay with bruce springsteen and i would always call the house. I had Bruce Springsteen's phone number. That's cool. I'd say, is Bruce, I would say, is Bruce there? And he says, oh, you want to, do you want to speak to the real Bruce? But he'd always say that. And then he would hand the phone to Bruce Hornsby. So I, I said, well, I'm, I'm the guy. I introduced <laughs> that, that call. Oh, you're David. I said, yeah, I'm David. Anyway, we ended up giving him one of the band, his son. So I said, well, what the hell are you doing? What are you he says, well, you know, my son, he's 14. I think he was 14 at the time, maybe younger. Anyway, he goes, why do I know every Breaking Benjamin song? Lacrosse, soccer, hockey, football. You know, and he went on and on. And he goes, who do you think drives them? Your kid's putting the Breaking Benjamin CD on every time you get in the car. And everywhere is 30 to 40 minutes from you. So I go through a whole album. Over and over again, <laughs> driving my kid to sports. And now it's like, you know, and we're in A sharp. And I, and he goes, how do you get that bottom man? That, 
He says, I said, well, I produced the records. He goes, how do you get that bottom? And he says, it's ridiculous. I wish I could. I said, well, you're going to have to, you have to tune down to A sharp. <laughs> you know, I think Bruce is an E. So that's not going to happen. <laughs> I love it. I love the records. Uh, and he goes, and I, I, and he, you know, Bruce was singing along. The sound man was told me that Bruce was singing along to the Breaking Benjamin songs because he knew all the lyrics, which is a testament to, to the band. I know this sounds crazy, but you can sort of see why he would be able to sing along because Bruce was a cover band guy. Hmm. And, you know, he he could learn lyrics and, and melodies. And, you know, he knew the band songs extremely well. And his kid was a huge fan. That's so cool. Uh, but it was at that moment, I, I had a pivotal moment in my own career. Mm-hmm. And um, I, and he liked me and I, I liked him and we just got to talking. And I said, you know, you play a four hour set. I said, would you go see anybody play for four hours? He goes, no way. He says, well, we, <laughs> we, we do take a 20-minute break. And I said, you know, I know, but it's pretty amazing that you, how many songs? You know, oh, he says 120 songs. And there's a guy underneath the stage, and he throws up the lyrics and the videos, chord charts. And, so cool. You know, the whole band has to jump on it. I mean, I had a lot of respect already for Bruce. And I said, I said to him, you know, Bruce, what is it that makes – an audience come and see you for four hours and and they keep coming because it's incredible and he looked at me and he goes that's that's a good question because uh you know let me go get a beer <laughs> but i didn't see him you know he kind of disappeared on me <laughs> and uh, i figured oh whatever you know maybe i said something i shouldn't have said and upset him or maybe he really did have to go think about it because probably no one ever asked him that before yeah. And he came back and he, and he said, I have your answer. Said, um, when I walk on the stage and I look at the audience, I see my whole life. And when they look at me, they see their whole life. And it's like one big family album that we all look at together. Hmm. And I thought that was pretty incredible. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because, cause, I mean, with... So many bands you associate your your like deepest experiences with them. So yeah, that that does make sense actually. That's really cool. And like I know myself personally, like a lot of concerts I go to. I mean, the longer the better. You know what I mean? Especially when you're really into the band that you're checking out. So I think when music connect connects people like Breaking Benjamin, where there's a sound and there's an identifiable voice, and you're guaranteed you're going to get into a mood that you want to be in to feel uplifting or blue, whatever it is you want to feel. Uh, when the audience comes together, it creates a whole different you know, thing because everyone's feeling that together, even though they might have a different meaning. Mm. Um, certain music transcends everything, and it's an instant time machine. It's probably the best way to travel mm. in time better than anything on earth. You know, you, a song will take you back to a moment in your life. And... When we made records, especially with Breaking Benjamin, we were very cognizant of the fact that if we didn't achieve a certain mood or a certain vibe from the vocals, especially, that we sort of lost the plot completely. Hmm. Um, And so different days, we would do songs sometimes different days, the same song, to see if we got a different result. A lot of experimenting. 